Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of B2B Revealed. B2B Revealed brings you the best of B2B. Whether you're a B2B seller, a B2B marketer, or simply a B2B leader, this show will provide you the tools and insights you need to be successful. My name is Sean Campbell. I'm the CEO of Cascade Insights, and I'm your host. I love to hear from listeners. If you have any questions about the show, or you would like to suggest a topic I should cover in the future, just email me at sean, S-E-A-N, at cascadeinsights.com. On this episode, I'll be interviewing Ryan O'Donnell. Ryan is the founder of Replyify, Sellhack, and Sociogram. Ryan has a ton of experience with sales outreach in a B2B setting. He has a lot of great things to say about what works with cold email outreach, what doesn't, and how you can warm up your cold emails in general. Finally, if you love this show, don't forget to post a review of the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you happen to listen. And now, on to the show. Ryan, welcome to the show. Sean, glad to be here. Ryan, could you give folks a little bit of your background? I, I gave a little bit of an intro as the show kicked off, but I'm sure folks would love to hear a little more detail. Sure thing. So I've been in sales. I guess sales can tend to be an ugly word sometimes. I don't always like to say that I'm a sales guy, but I guess I've been in sales for the last 10 years. Um, got my start right out of college on Wall Street, making 500 phone calls a day, connecting with 50 people, generating five leads, closing one account. So I've done the smile and dial approach, working off of index cards of leads that we built over the weekend and came in on Monday and worked through them, right? I left Wall Street, went into tech, had a few successful runs there, ended up at a company that we sold to Yahoo back in 2007, spun out of that, had various startups that I created, different degrees of success, and really got into the world of B2B sales and building software that helps B2B sellers to solve a personal pain point. I was sat back and looked at where we succeeded and where we failed and just realized I was spending so much time over the course of a week that I could have been doing other things. And as a founder specifically, or as someone who lives and dies by, they eat what they kill, right? There are so many different things that you could be doing in a sales role. You wanna spend your time selling. You wanna spend your time working with clients. And I just wasn't doing that. So got my start about four years ago, working on a company called Sellhack, um, prospect list generation tool, email verification, and then you know started up Replyify about it over the past year, really to solve a problem that Sellhack bore. And that was, hey, we have, a list of contacts, how the heck do we reach out to these folks? And how do we get out of our inbox and scheduling reminders and doing things one by one? And how do we automate it so we can get back to that holy grail, which is freeing up time to do the things that we need to do, which is have conversations with our prospective clients to be able ultimately to generate a more consistent pipeline. Cool. That's a really good summary. So let's talk a little bit right off the bat about how to structure these emails, because I think a lot of where folks go wrong is they kind of assume immediate success or they're kind of just doing it wrong and they don't understand why nobody's replying, right? And then we'll get into how this kind of relates to spam and legislation and when it can go really wrong, when it's kind of the wrong thing to do. And then we'll kind of cover a few other topics too. But first off, when do you think are the right and wrong times to send a cold email? time of day? Well, just more kind of where in the relationship or kind of sales process is the right time. Because I think people assume you can always send a cold email to anyone at any time. And I don't necessarily know if that's entirely appropriate either. I think you can. I don't see a reason why you can't. We are on this call today because I sent you a cold email. Because I was sitting around probably two, three weeks ago and working through our content and growth strategy. And if you want to edit this out because you don't want to get a barrage of people listening, sending you emails, suggesting that we connect, feel free to do so. But if you leave this in, I was sitting around a couple of weeks ago, I said, gosh, I haven't talked to another B2B expert who has an audience who's probably asking the same questions that I'm thinking about every single day. And I said, all right, how do I go out and find the top B2B sales or marketing or growth related podcasts out there? How do I hone in and find the hosts and the people who are responsible for inviting folks to join them in a conversation? And then how do I reach out to them? So I don't care if it's sales, if it's getting an invitation to be on a podcast like this, whether it's promoting something that you just launched with the press release, whether it's suggesting a guest blog post, right, with a content strategy. Anytime you send an email, there has to be a goal in mind. So for some folks listening, you're selling. So your goal 99% of the time is going to be on sales. And I think if you spend the time to focus on finding the right people, 
to contact and finding them efficiently and getting their contact info and then creating a sequence of emails or other touch points like a phone call or social selling activities, which over time is going to make it really easy for that person to say, yes, I'm interested. Let's move to the next step or no, I'm not interested and I'm not a good fit. And both of those outcomes, I don't look at as equally the same. I mean, I'd rather get a yes every time. Let's move to the next step. But when you get a no, it's not a bad thing. That's one less person you have to spend your time chasing down and trying to find. And the goal of what we build, and I promise I'm not going to make this a big commercial for Replyify and, and talk about our tech, but it fits into the whole process and mindset. It's all about efficiency. It's finding ways to automate some of these more mundane and manual tasks to free up that time to do other things. So to your question, when's a good time to sell it? Anytime you don't know someone and can't get a great referral to them or a direct introduction, reaching out via cold email with a relevant message targeted to them that kind of follows those can spam regulations. If you live here in the US, there are a lot of different governing bodies for different countries that you're in. But if you follow the best practices that folks have put out there on the web about how to write a cold email that's can spam compliant, I don't think there's a wrong time to reach out to anyone. No, and that's a fair point, but you got to exactly what I was getting at. And I think the listeners have all had this happen to them, and, and I know you and I probably have too, is that you got a cold email, but it didn't have all those attributes you talked about, including it wasn't targeted, it wasn't relevant, there wasn't appropriate research done. And so that was kind of maybe a wrong time to send one, at least in the sense that it wasn't packaged correctly. So I'm curious what you think about that, because you mentioned a lot of things there that kind of have to be done to do it the right way, basically. Yeah, it all starts with the process. I think it was Abe Lincoln who said it was the whole measure twice, cut once. So you want to start where it's really easy with the low hanging fruit. If you're a founder, right, with a B2B products or service, or you're in sales, or you're a marketer, and you have some offer or some reason that you want to get in front of someone and really start a conversation, the first place to start is who are those people? And the easiest place to look is if you already have clients, look at your existing client base. Take your last 10 or 20 clients. This is a manual exercise. Open up an Excel doc. Right? I want you to create different columns in your Excel doc. I want title, industry, company size, keywords, location, and start to build this out. And then I want you to go and do some manual research. And what you're looking for is you start to research each of your last 10 or 20 sales that you've actually done. People who've said yes and purchased your product or service. I want you to fill out that spreadsheet and what you'll start to see and what you should be looking for are densities, right? You want to look for patterns or clusters. You don't want to just make assumptions, put data to it. If you think that you sell into a VP of marketing, for example, but after your research, you actually learn that the majority of your clients are CEOs of B2B tech companies with under 10 employees. Start there because that density and that cluster can actually be turned into metadata, which can be searched. And that same search, CEO, title, located in the US, company size under 10 people with a keyword SaaS or B2B is going to yield a couple thousand people in a search result. Those are the few thousand people that you should be reaching out to. Okay. And then we go into the actual reach out, right? And structuring your campaign. And you're going to talk to a founder at a 10 person tech company differently than you're going to speak to a VP of marketing at a 10,000 person company. They care about different things. So when you're structuring your campaign and you're talking to these folks and you're literally thinking through, it's like writing a book. I'm going to start with my first connection point, my introduction email. And then over the course of the next four to six weeks, my plan is to reach out to these folks five to 10 times with a multitude of whatever your flow is. Maybe it's seven emails, two phone calls and one connection request on LinkedIn. But you want to structure your campaign and then it just comes down to finding contacts dropping them into this campaign, which is personalized to the sense that you're writing a specific sequence of emails or devising a specific sequence of events that have been customized for that specific audience. And then for that VP of marketing set, our suggestion is you have a completely separate campaign and that's a completely different search. So what it comes down to for the day-to-day -day kind of blocking and tackling and execution of this, you need to figure out where to spend your time and how to actually do this. Maybe you wanna reach out and engage with 25 new tech startup CEOs. And at the same time, you wanna engage with 25 VPs of marketing who are working at the Fortune 500. And maybe you have a third campaign, which is reaching out to influential blogs in your niche, trying to generate some sort of content partnership. The beauty of all of this is once you actually create these different sequences 
and you put a strategy around reaching out to these different segments or personas, it becomes really easy to keep that going. Because once the automation takes over on the email side, you're just feeding the beast. Every day, every week, you're entering or you're uploading or pushing X number of new contacts into this predefined, very targeted campaign that's going to automatically deliver on your behalf over a period of time. You wait for the replies to come in good or bad, and you either ratchet up or ratchet down the number of contacts you enter into that campaign, and that's going to turn into your consistent pipeline. That's going to keep your revenue numbers exceeding targets. And it's really easy to adjust that mix of the number of prospects that you drop in to a specific campaign that are going to yield the number of conversations, demos, meetings, whatever, that are going to generate the sales that you need to exceed at your job. That's a really good summary. A couple things there. One, totally get what you're saying about looking at yourself and analyzing the data. I mean, we did that and continue to do that. Like one of the things that always jumps out to us, for example, is for our mid-market companies we serve in tech, it's usually a VP of marketing that pays us to do research. And we saw that in our own data, right? Meanwhile, in enterprise accounts, it's a mix because you have fairly big market research teams sometimes in those accounts. So they may pay a little more attention to us and have a little more outsized influence on our pipeline than you'd have in a mid-market where they don't really have those size of teams. And to your point, it does affect kind of our sales and marketing messaging because we know we have to hit those audiences differently. So one thing that I think is really important to cover though, and I saw this just recently, but you see it in other places too. I saw it in a, um, the Association for Inside Sales Professionals runs conferences regularly. And there was a session there that I saw that mentioned about sequencing and how long the sequence needs to run. And this presenter said 30, I'm just roughly remembering the number here, but it was 35% of the responses to a campaign come on emails five through eight. And I think that's a really important point to get your commentary on, because I think a lot of people think of cold email cadences, at least if you haven't ever built one before, and they think of it in terms of the way you would respond kind of to an individual, right? You know, I don't really hit them six times when I'm just asking my boss for something, right? I hit them maybe two, three times, and then I try to find some other way to communicate with them. But I would imagine you found that if you stopped every cold email sequence at number three, they wouldn't be nearly as successful as they could be. Exactly. I mean, we like to see, and this isn't prescriptive. I'll just give you some quick kind of best practices here. We like to see three to five sentences per email. We like five to 10 emails delivered over the course of 30 to 45 days with a mix of give and take. So you're giving them something of value. It might be you know, an offer you have or a suggestion that they read a piece of awesome content that you built or sharing a couple tips with them, showing them a blog post, right? So having content is important there when you're giving them value. And at the same time, you're extracting value from them. You're asking them for their time. You're asking them to go to your website to sign up for something. So having that mix of give and take without saying the same thing, it's really hard not to say the same thing over the course of five to 10 emails. And at the very least, you cannot send naked emails. And we refer to naked emails as we've all gotten them and and we've probably all sent them. A naked email is an email that you send to someone that says, hey, Sean, following up on my last email. Right, we've all gotten hundreds of those basically (laughs) at this point, yeah. It's the lazy way out, but it becomes filler because people hear these things like, okay, 30% of your replies are gonna come from emails, let's say five through 10. And if you're only capable of writing five emails that make sense. How do you stretch that campaign out? So there are a lot of different tactics to employ there. Typically what we'll do towards the end of a campaign, maybe on email seven or eight, I'll give the person permission to basically say, I've ignored your first six emails and I kind of feel embarrassed about it. And that's why I'm gonna ignore everything else because I'm a little bit embarrassed, but I also don't care that much. There's no skin in the game here, but I've ignored your first six, what's gonna make me reply to your seventh email, I'll give them the option to let me know that they're just not interested. I'll give them a one, two, three, and it'll say, hey, I'm interested. Let's set a call up. No, I'm not interested. And then the third option will be go away, Ryan. And I'll ask them literally just reply back with a one, two, three. I might send a breakup email. Typically when I don't hear back from people, I assume they're not interested. If that's the case, I won't contact you again. If that's not the case and you've just been too busy, let me know. It's okay if you've been too busy to reply to my first six emails and we get a response rate off of that. And then my final email or how I kind of stretch that campaign even further, my very last email might be something like last quick question for the subject line. And then I'll say, hey, Sean, doesn't seem like you're the right person for me to speak with about X, Y, or Z. Is there someone else at your company that I should speak with? So I give them the opportunity to get me off of their plate 
where they don't have to keep deleting my emails, but they can then take this and send it to the right person. And that internal referral converts at an astronomically high percentage because it's someone within the organization suggesting to someone else in the same organization that they should speak with me. So there are ways to extend and get to that. How do you write those emails five through 10, trying to avoid the whole repeating the same thing over and over and not sounding like a person. The goal here is to sell like a robot, but also sound like a human being. And I know you've got some good commentary on your site about how to do that, how to write the emails kind of in an appropriate cadence. And, you know, we obviously can't talk through the body of the emails on a podcast, but there is one thing we could probably talk about at least briefly is the subject line. You kind of alluded to it a minute ago. I'm just following up kind of thing. And you can picture that as the canonical following up subject line. So what are some things that folks typically do wrong with subject lines or some examples of just ones that should just be retired and never be used again? And what's an example of a really good subject line that you've seen or just kind of a cat category of subject lines that are really good to use. Let me break that up into three different parts. So folks who are listening, one of the best things to do and something that I practice daily, I have two folders in my inbox, right? I have one folder and two subfolders. It's my cold email folder. And I have a good cold email and a bad cold email. And I keep track of, because I get cold emails all the time and I'm open to them, but I pay attention to what are the emails that got me to open and what are the emails that I gave a quick look to and move them into this bad cold email folder. So pay attention from here on out, create those folders and pay attention to the emails that you're getting and what gets you motivated. And then you can borrow those tactics. So some of the good tactics that I've borrowed, I mix them up over the sequence of my campaign, but I'll give some examples there. I like to use the person's name in the subject line for at least one email. It signals to them that this may not be an email that was sent out to 10,000 people because I've taken the time to personalize the subject line. I don't like long subject lines. You want to think about what someone can see on their phone. There's a certain character limit there. I like to test out using a person's name. Sometimes I like to thread a reply where I'll send three emails that are basically replies to my previous emails. And then later in my campaign, I'll break off of the thread and I'll send a completely new email thread. And sometimes I'll try subject lines that are just one word, quick question, offer. If I'm offering something to someone, I'll put thank you for one of my last emails. I'll just write thank you. I might write demo as a subject line. So if there were only seven subject lines that you should ever use, at some point they would be used so often that the impact that they have would lose its efficacy. The best thing to do is pay attention to the things that get you to open emails and then use those borrow them. They're not intellectual property. And then when you're thinking of, of the bad subject lines to use, obviously, if you're going to use the person's first name and you're using technology like Replyify to send out your cold emails, make sure that if you're using a custom insert or we call them variables to autofill someone's first name, make sure that you have a backup or a fallback value. So if the person's first name isn't included in that data set, then it's going to automatically fill in something else that's going to make sense. So high first name, alternate there, you know, T-H-E-R-E. But you can't use that in a subject line. You've got to get creative. You can use automation, but just make sure that you have a fallback to the automation. Because the worst thing you can do is show someone you don't want to expose what you're actually doing. You don't want them to know that you are using technology. The goal of all of this, again, is to sell like a robot, but sound like a human. You want these emails to look and feel like you wrote them one-to-one -to, -one to that person. And those are important things to think about when you're picking the right technology or you're moving into starting to automate things that you have those safety features built in and that you're setting up your campaigns correctly. I'll pause there, Sean. No, no, it's fine. It was all really, really good stuff. So one other thing I want to talk about with email structure, and then I want to get into some of the issues around spam and how it relates to this kind of activity. Where do people go wrong with their CTA? Because I think we've all seen the CTA that asks for too much or is nebulous and obviously, I could only imagine you'd agree that both of those things are bad, much less than probably other bad behavior you've seen. So the CTA, at the beginning of the campaign, you have a purpose, right? and everyone's got a different purpose. We're here on, on your B2B podcast. So for the folks who are selling B2B, my assumption is going to be the majority of you are going to sell your B2B after a demo or a call, and you might even offer a free trial or an upgraded trial or limited time access only after you've qualified the person. The CTA needs to be low commitment. If someone was on their phone, sitting on the toilet, for example, and scrolling through their emails, right? You want to give them an easy enough call to action that they can respond right there and take action on it. 
that's what you're trying to solve for. You want to write a simple enough subject line that's going to get them to open the email. You want to write a concise enough email that has three to five sentences in it that's going to get them to read through your email. And then that call to action needs to be simple enough for them to be able to take action right then and there. I think where people get messed up on the CTAs, asking rhetorical questions. I think it's good to ask a question to someone, but if you ask them too much of a thought provoking question or something that makes them think too much, or you're asking them to buy your product or service right out of the gates or send you through some data, that's way too much. So I typically tend to skew towards something along the lines of, and I'll say this differently, it's pretty much the same CTA every time because my goal of my cold email campaigns I want to have a call with someone. I want to have a really quick call because I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste theirs. I need five minutes. I want to ask you three questions and those three questions are going to help me qualify you. And if you're qualified, I'm going to upgrade your account and give you access to an upgraded trial so you can try out our tech. If you're not qualified, I'm going to suggest an alternative path, but I really only want five minutes. So I'll ask for those five minutes in a couple different ways. I'll ask them, how does your calendar look next week for a quick call? In a different email, I might say, hey, if it makes sense, here's my calendar scheduling link. So you can pick out time that's convenient for you looking at my calendar link. And I'll also ask them as part of the same CTA, I'll say, or send me yours. I'll make it really easy for them to send me their scheduling link. What I'm trying to do is make it really easy for someone to sit there, click a link, look at their calendar, book time on their calendar, and then we talk next week. Or I wanna give them an easy way to send me their calendar link again so we can get to that same end goal. So again, your CTA should be very simple and it should correspond with whatever the outcome of your campaign is that you decided upfront when you were actually building this thing out. It should be very simple and very easy to reply to. Cool. That's a really good summary. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about just the process of automation here, the fact that you can do it. I think when you give folks the automated capability you've described, that comes with a level of responsibility, right? So if you think about it from the corporate side, right, you know, they might be feeling like I'm tired of unwanted emails and they've felt that for years. That doesn't have anything to do with whether the platform's automated or not. But what's your answer to folks who might say like automating this process just might give me more emails I don't need? You've already alluded to targeting and making sure you're, in essence, using the platform responsibly. But I think that might be kind of a question folks might be thinking in their heads is like, well, is this just going to generate more emails I don't need? And so what's your response to that? Are you coming at it from the perspective of the seller thinking that by automating this process, they're going to get more emails? No, just from the buyer perspective. The idea that at least if somebody has to type each individual email, there's a delaying effect in me getting emails. But, you know, if you can load up 2,000 names, right, does that generate more corporate spam versus not. And leaving aside for a minute the distinction of whether it's spam, because it isn't really, but we'll get to that in a minute. But just this idea of how should someone kind of responsibly use a platform like this? Boo-hoo, right? So what, the person's getting too many emails. That's not my problem. My solution is I have something that I believe can help them. And I believe it can help them based on me helping other people with my same product or service and them being similar to those same people based on the research that I did. Automating cold emails is fairly new. It's not the way my dad sold. But reaching out to people that you've never engaged with before has been going on for since the beginning of trade. How do you think, how else does business get done? especially if you don't have an incredibly strong network or you're building your network, you have to reach out to people that you don't have any other way of communicating with, or you can elect not to and not be successful or not hit your targets or not generate the type of sales or revenue or even your personal income and not meeting your potential there. So I look at it first off of saying that I represent and I'm selling a product that I know based on my experience of having clients that we help to do good things and save time and generate more sales. I know that I can help out the majority of B2B companies out there who I'm assuming are doing the same thing, are reaching out to people, are prospecting, making cold calls or sending emails one by one. So the very first thing is truly believing that the product or service that you represent is going to offer value to that person. Now, where you can set yourself apart from the other 15 people that might email the same person that day is taking the time to create a relevant message for that person that's concise with a simple call to action that gives as much as it takes and and helps to make it really easy for them 
to reply to you and say, yes, I'm interested. Let's move to that call you suggested or no, I'm not interested. And between those two points, you're going to have people who reply back to you and say, oh, my gosh, thank you. We were talking about this two weeks ago. Perfect timing for you to reach out. Let's get something set up today. And then you're going to have folks who write back in all caps and say, if you send me another email like this again, I'm going to tell my lawyer or don't ever contact me again. And you have to have thick skin for those people. And then you're going to find folks in the middle who just said, hey, interesting offer, not a great time for us. And you're going to follow up with them and say, great, glad you're interested. When's a good time for me to circle back with you? How's December before you're making decisions for 2018? And then you're always working towards getting that meeting. So as long as you're creating campaigns that are communicating your message effectively to an audience you believe you can help, the difference between sending 20 emails a day or 200 emails a day, the only person who makes that call and whether that's right or wrong is you. And from my perspective, the only determining factor in you identifying whether you need to send 20 emails or 200 emails is your conversion rate. Of those 20 emails, if you can generate five meetings per day and you can only manage five meetings per day, then 20 is your number. There's no reason to send out 200. So as you're going through this process and just getting started in cold email, the last thing you want to do is come at it with a list of 10,000 people and blast those out. I like to see more of a staggered approach where you've got maybe a list of 10,000 people, but you start sending out 50 emails a day and you let that bake for a couple of weeks. And you look back and say, oh, out of 50 emails a day, I generate one qualified lead or, or two demos and one qualified lead. And if that keeps your pipeline full, fantastic. If your pipeline could benefit from four more meetings, then you need to step that up. That's a really, really good summary of, I think, the dynamic. Everything you said there about starting slow, building toward a larger list, being very specific about your targeting, all that stuff's really solid. So one thing you said in there was about the person who says, I didn't want this email, whatever. And the only reason I want to come back to that, and you've written on this on a LinkedIn Pulse post, and you've written on other places, is the distinction between cold email and spam. And I think it's really important to hit because it's like we see in our work, right? Market research outreach is actually considered a protected and separate type of email in U.S. can spam legislation. And it is either explicitly or implicitly so in almost every other can spam like legislation around the world. And there's good reasons for that, because even the government itself wants to be able to conduct surveys, right, and be able to send outreach and censuses and things like that. But one of the things I've noticed is, especially over the last couple of years, is in the business community, there tends to be this kind of mapping of any unwanted email from someone I don't know is spam, period, end of statement. And that's simply not true, as you made a good point a couple times in stuff that you've written. So why don't you break that down for listeners a little bit? Because I think unwanted doesn't mean spam. And that's a really key distinction. I'll approach it from the seller's perspective. Anyone who writes back to me in all caps and threatens me or basically screams at me or, or tries to take a personal shot is someone I don't want to do business with. There are going to be exceptions to that. You might catch someone on a bad day. And you're the 10th person who's emailed them out of the blue and they're just car broke down, flights delayed, missing their kids game, and they're just upset. So they're going to take it out on you. But again, having thick skin from the seller's perspective is part of this. There are going to be people who really buy into what you have and get excited and see the value. And there's going to be people who take a much more short sighted approach. And they actually some folks will get mean with you. And you have to reassure yourself that even if people are getting nasty with you, there are still people out there that you're helping. And it's your goal to not get frustrated, not get bogged down, not let that nasty person, that mean person who had that comment, not let them influence you. Because it's your job, it's your mission to find more people like the folks that you're actually helping. From the can spam perspective, and just disclaimer, I'm not indemnifying folks who follow some of my comments. If you have questions, contact your in-house counsel, but there are some general best practices to follow. And if you follow those practices, then from my perspective, I'm not as concerned about running into the can spam trap. Really quick, kind of seven points. Don't use false or misleading contact information. You should be sending an email from your email address that clearly states who you are. Don't make up a fictitious email address and name just because you don't want your cold email getting assigned to you. Step one. Second is don't use deceptive subject lines. So you want to use a subject line that corresponds to the body of your email or the spirit of your offer or message inside of that email. So you can't write an email that says, hey, do you want $25,000? And then someone gets the email and you're like, hey, here, buy these diet pills. 
and you'll be able to work harder and your subject lines can't be deceptive. If your email is an ad, it has to be labeled as such. What that typically means is, or distillation of that is, don't sell something in your email. Your email should be the gateway to start a conversation, not for you to sell your product or service. So an ad is defined as something that is selling something. So you can avoid that regulation or that component of the regulation by not suggesting that someone buys your product or service. Instead, suggesting that you move to the next step, which might be that phone call, that meeting, that demo, for example. You've got to give the recipient your address. Typically, that's easy to put in the signature of your email. This is the big one, and I think people get confused on my next point too much. And if we have time, let's dig into this for an extra minute or two. You have to give the recipient a way to opt out. That doesn't mean that you need an unsubscribe link in your email. Unsubscribe links from a deliverability standpoint can actually hurt your deliverability. So where you think that you might be following the regulations, and you are, if you have an unsubscribe link in your email, when the receiving party's internet service provider or their company's mail filters are picking up on this message and they see an unsubscribe button in there, that can increase your likelihood of automatically getting routed to the spam folder or your email ending up in the promotions or other inbox. All you have to do is give the recipient a way to opt out. So one alternative to an unsubscribe link is putting a note maybe in the PS or above your signature or below your signature that says, hey, if you'd prefer I not email you anymore, just reply back and let me know. Which brings us to the sixth point, and that's you have to honor opt-outs. So if someone replies back and they want to be taken off your list, you have to take them off your list. And one of the challenges with trying to send out cold emails by hand or using the wrong software to do it is managing all of these different types of responses, whether it's the opt-out, the spam complaint, the reply that they're interested in talking to you, that's where those processes don't scale. That's where they start to become bottlenecks. And then the seventh component for can spam is monitoring what others are doing on your behalf. So you can't just hire a third-party sales agency or third-party marketing firm to do this on your behalf and expect to be indemnified from any potential practices of these can spam regulation that they don't follow, which could land you in hot water. That's a really good summary of all seven points. They're really critical. I like what you said about the unsubscribe link, because I think where that comes in is this misperception of what that really means, right? I think people have seen it typically a certain way, especially from like retailers and mass marketers and things like that. So then they assume that that has to be applied universally. But to your point, that's not the case. Right, because an unsubscribe link implies that I've already subscribed. That's not the case here. This person is not subscribed to receive messages from you, which would make sense for an unsubscribe option to be included if they don't want to get any more messages from you. This is an email that you sent this person that's not trying to sell them anything, but it's following those kind of seven steps I went through. And it's really just trying to start a conversation or suggest a time and place to meet so that you can determine if there is a reason for you to continue a conversation. Really, all you're trying to let the person know is that if they don't want to get messages from you anymore, it's very simple. Just let me know and I won't email you. I'd rather not waste my time sending you emails that you're not interested in. And, but within that kind of response cycle, you're going to have responses that are very, very positive and they're inspirational. When you get them, you're like, gosh, I'm doing something right. I'm going to keep going. And then you're going to get the negative ones, the detractors. And those are going to be the ones that kind of get you backed into that corner where you feel like, hey, maybe I shouldn't be doing this more. But at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself a couple of questions, and that's, do I really believe in the product and service that I'm backing? Do I think it can help these people? And in order for me to help them, what do I need to do? Do I need to actually have a conversation with them? Do I need to schedule a demo? Do we need to talk first? If you answer yes to all of those, then I don't feel any qualms about sending a cold email. My cold emails are very targeted, but there are going to be people who just don't know that they could or should be benefiting from that product or service that you're bringing to their attention. Cool. So what led you to build Replyify? You moved into a market where there were some solutions that are similar at least, whether they compete directly or not, but there's some similar solutions out there. So what led you to build Replyify to begin with? So we had been running a platform called Sellhack, and it started that back in 2014, prospect list 
building an email verification and validation system. So whether you had a conference attendee list and you wanted to get emails from it, or you're out there searching the web or looking at your prospects, team pages, or finding them on social media, and you have like a first name, a last name, and a company, and you want to send them in a cold email, but you don't have their email address. So Cellhack helped to, to get that email address and cut the time and number of, of different websites you had to go to to try to guess the email or verify or validate it. Right. So we'd been doing that for like four years. The next step, once you have an email address, then you have to reach out to people. You actually have to email them. And over time, we use our own products and services. So we build our own list and we email people. And similar to what you brought up in the past earlier in the conversation, there are lots of folks out there who believe that a cold email sequence is the most efficient way of generating a consistent, repeatable, predictable pipeline and revenue. So one option at one end of the spectrum is you can send out your cold emails and all of your follow-up emails right from your inbox. And that takes a lot of time. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got tools like MailChimp and some of these more traditional marketing automation systems, which are awesome tools, but they're not meant for cold emails because the emails, without getting into all the technical reasons why, we have a blog post on this, blog.replyify.com, if anyone's interested in reading more on this, but these traditional marketing automation systems, they send their emails through their own IP addresses, not yours. So they want to send out United Airlines 10 million last minute airfare specials every Tuesday to their 10 million subscribers. They don't want to send out Ryan's 200 emails a day to other B2B execs asking to set up time to talk about automating their sales process. So these companies were actually going in and because it's against their terms of service, they were actually canceling accounts or suspending accounts. And what that does 